Sergio's new office was outstanding. His new job was not. The office wasn't huge. It was in a corner office or anything. Honestly, it was just a small plain room tucked between the break room and a conference room. But it was his. Plus, his windows had shades, which for some reason were missing from the windows out on the design floor. Sergio happily pulled those shades down when the sun came around to spear his eyes at two in the afternoon. The shade pulling moment was, however, the only happy moment of the day. The rest of the day was just a mind numbing blur as he tried to get up to speed with what Sanders had been doing, or rather had not been doing. After just two hours of assessing the situation, he understood why Sanders had left earlier than expected. This was not a job for one person, it was a job for at least 10 people, plus assistants. Clive was right, Sergio was an idiot. He hadn't been told what his pay rise would be before he applied for the promotion, but he figured it would be a decent increase. He was wrong. He was only going to get another thousand dollars a month to do ten times more work. I mean, that's still quite a lot. <laughs> Idiot, he muttered to himself as he tried to organise the few tasks he thought he might be able to get done today. If he stayed until nearly midnight. Sergio's door opened and Clive's head popped in, along with the aromas wafting over from the break room. Sergio could smell coffee, popcorn and someone's microwaved burritos. How's the new job? Clive asked. Sergio dropped his head to the pile of paperwork in front of him and pounded it a couple of times. That good, huh? Clive came the rest of the way into the room and sat in one of the narrow leather and stainless steel chairs in front of Sergio. He looked around at Sergio's plain oak desk, the other chair, the shelves piled with project files and the drafting table tucked in the corner. So you do have a drafting table, Clive noted. Think you'll get used to it? Sergio didn't answer the question. Instead, he asked, do you ever think we reach our ideals? Clive turned sideways and put his feet up on the other chair in front of a desk. That's a deep question. Sorry, I know you hate to use your dozen or so brain cells to think about deep questions. Yeah, you're stressing me out here. Never mind. No, it's a good question. Honest answer. I don't think ideals are actually real. I think they exist only in our heads. I mean, have you ever drawn something that was as good as you imagined it in your head? If you have, I'll buy you dinner every night for a week, because I sure haven't. As tempting as it is to lie to get those dinners, Sergio said, grinning. No, I haven't. There you go. We're all a bunch of donkeys. What? You know, the carrot and the stick. We're just a bunch of donkeys, plodding along, trying to reach a carrot that will forever dangle out in front of us, no matter how far we plod. That's depressing. Clive shrugged and shook his head, doing an unintentional impression of Bubbles, the labradoodle. Then my work is done, he grinned. Seriously, I don't think it's depressing at all. It's kind of freeing when you think about it. If we can't get what we want, why bother trying? Just do your best and have a good time. He paused and saluted. Mr. Idiot, sir. He bowed multiple times as he backed out of Sergio's office. Sergio laughed, then sobered and tried to concentrate on work. Two and a half weeks into the new position, Sergio had doubled his caffeine consumption, and still he was constantly ten paces ahead. He'd already made two dump mistakes that cost the firm several thousand dollars, and he'd been berated twice by a client. Dale assured him this was a normal part of the learning curve for the project manager's job, but Sergio was still mortified. He was also bored and disappointed. He'd thought that becoming the project manager would give him more leeway in to implement cutting edge design ideas, more freedom to break past the boundaries of the usual renovations his department did. For some time, he was frustrated by the safe, limited changes their clients made to their homes. He wanted to be given carte blanche to bust into a place, demo the heck out of it, and turn it into something else entirely. He thought a project manager would hold enough sway that he could make that, that vision of reality. He was wrong. The, project, the projects he had to oversee were the same old things, and now, in addition to disliking the types of jobs he was working on, he had the responsibility for more aspects of those jobs. This new position really was just more work and no more satisfaction. Not only was work in full suck mode, but his home life such as it was, had gone down the toilet as well. Mr. Bailey had taken to staying up late so she could greet him with her latest suggestions for getting more, see more sleep. Then there was the talent, oh, sorry, talent? Then there was the tenant who lived above him. 
The woman who had the apartment on the next floor up took dancing lessons. He'd been listening to her stomping around above his head for weeks. He didn't know her name, but he'd given her the title of Thunderfeet. Now, for some reason, Thunderfeet was practicing until 2am. He tried to talk to her about it one night, but after scolding him for ringing her doorbell too late, she called him names that made him blush. Also, because he never had time to go to the grocery store, he was eating more takeout, and because he was so tired when he got home, he rarely exercised, and instead just dropped into bed. These two changes had resulted in a disturbing pot belly that was growing with each passing day. Oh no, it's a reprieve in the flesh. Sergio's dissatisfaction was growing with each passing day too, so with the number of hours he was working. It was near midnight most nights when he left the firm, and he always came home with a stack of work to look over before he went to bed. As if all this wasn't bad enough, Violet hated Sergio's new long hours even more than he did, and it was turning her into a nag. How come you have to work all the time, Sergio? She asked him on Saturday night at the end of his first week as project manager. They were at a party she insisted they attend, even though they couldn't get there until after 10.30pm because he worked until then. He knew she was going to want to stay until at least two or later, and then he was going to have to get up and go to work early Sunday morning. If he didn't, there was no way he could handle Monday. Um, because it's part of the new job? Sergio said with a thick layer of sarcasm. The new job I just got promoted into. It's a high workload job. What do you suggest I do? Get a saw and cut the workload in half? He never should have said that. Violet laughed hysterically, and everyone at the party turned to stare at them. And so it went. Work. Try and please his girlfriend. Get home late. Deal with Mrs. Bailey. Eat junk. Listen to th Thunderfeet. Finally, go to sleep. Rinse and repeat. His days were basically drudgery. The only few minutes in them that he really liked were those moments when he walked out of the building, admired his dedicated project manager's parking spot. Now there was a perk worth work working your tail off or not. Strolled to it and got in his car. That was his fleeting moment of freedom. Every night, he just got a few seconds of joy in the feeling of escape. But even that was beyond his reach on this rainy Tuesday night. Because the forecast had been for the usual sunshine, Sergio wasn't prepared for rain. Even though his new parking spot was only 20 feet from the firm's door, he and his stack of papers were soaked when he got into his SUV and he was cold, and he was hungry. Sergio put his papers on the passenger seat. He turned on the full heat blast, which caused the vehicle to steam up, and his wool suit started smelling like a wet farm animal. Or was that his own smell? He didn't know. Personal hygiene was another thing this job was taking from him. Pulling out of the parking lot, Sergio couldn't help but notice he had the road mostly to himself. It had been like that every night this week, which was why it was... Not just annoying, but screamingly inconvenient when his two-year-old SUV decided to die in the totally closed down and deserted re retail district of downtown. Sergio was barely able to coast to the curb before the SUV lost all momentum and drifted to a full silent stop. Sergio looked at the still bright dashboard lights, not the battery. He looked at the gas tank. It was half full, not out of gas. Are you kidding me? Sergio asked his vehicle. It had no response. He tried to restart the SUV. Nothing. There was no point in him looking under the hood. He knew nothing about vehicle engines. So, Sergio sat in the dead SUV and listened to rain thrumming on the roof. He tried to see through the grey murk of the falling water. Everything outside the SUV was vague and obscure, but from what he could tell, no one was around. He peered into the gloom, looking for an open sign on one of the storefronts. He didn't see any. This block had no bars or restaurants, so nothing was open. He thought about where he was, and he remembered there was a gas station two blocks over. Hopefully, he could get a tow truck there. But that meant walking in the rain for ten minutes. Oh joy. Sergio leaned his head on the steering wheel. What a perfectly awful end to a perfectly awful week. Sergio raised his hand, oh sorry, his head, and looked at the still wet stack of papers sitting on the passenger seat. He had the urge to pick them up and throw them out in the rain. He could see himself doing it in his mind's eye, and he could see himself dancing around on top of them. Blowing out air, Sergio motioned at his dead car and said, Camel's back, meet your last straw. The rain started coming down harder. 
Sergio leaned back in his seat and closed his eyes. How had he gotten here? After all this hard work, all his striving, all his determination, after all that comes this? A broken down SUV in the middle of the night in the pouring rain. Fine. Sergio opened the door and stepped out into the weather. He was soaked immediately. He slammed the SUV's driver's door, stomped forward two feet and kicked the front tyre as hard as he could. Ouch! Sir. <laughs> Hardly a scream, but Sergio screamed. He hopped around on one foot and marvelled at how much pain a toe could generate. Water slid down inside his collar and his hopping foot splashed water up his pants leg. Resisting the urge to kick his vehicle again, Sergio stomped away from it. Then he pulled his ruined suit jacket up over his head as a makeshift hood and he sloshed over to the sidewalk. There, he put his head down and trudged away. The streetlights provided enough illumination for him to see the sidewalk cracks and the curb. This was all he needed for navigation. He'd gone just a block when the rain started to let up, not really caring at that point because he was already wet enough and through, wet through and through. Sergio kept walking. But then two things happened at once. The rain stopped entirely and Sergio nearly tripped over an overstuffed green garbage bag lying in the middle of the sidewalk. Sergio lowered his suit coat and he looked around. The nearest street light poured pale yellow light down on a dumpster that had tipped part way over. Its contents were spilled all over the sidewalk. Partially eaten food, sodden papers and collapsed latte cups were strewn all around. Sergio began taking careful steps through the trash. He'd gone a couple of feet when the streetlight's glow hit something brightly coloured. Sergio assumed it was a plastic bowl or cup, but even so, he glanced at it as he passed. He stopped. It wasn't a plastic bowl or cup. It was... what, what was it? He's curious about the unique shape standing out among the ordinary refuse. Sergio took a step closer to it. It was a bright red propeller on top of a cap. Leaning over, Sergio discovered that the propeller cap was attached to the round head of a small, maybe 10 inch high plastic figurine. The figurine was that of a small boy with reddish brown hair, big blue eyes, an orange triangular nose, rosy cheeks, and a wide mouth full of pronounced white teeth. The figurine's round head was matched in shape and size with the trunk of its body, which res resembled a colorful bowling ball with arms and legs. The figurine was wearing a short sleeved two button shirt that had vertical red and blue stripes matching the pattern on the cap. The shirt was tucked into solid blue pants and the pants, wait, did I just read that? I don't know. <laughs> the, the shirt was tucked into solid blue pants and the pants cuffs uh, ended at the top of the pair of the plain brown shoes. The shoes were more rounded than foot shaped but they matched the boy's fig fingerless, stumpy hands. Both hands were occupied. The figurine's right hand held a large red and yellow striped balloon, and the figurine's right hand held a small sign that read, I'm a lucky boy. Hey, we've got a story about balloon boy. I'm assuming, I'm assuming. You are, oh wait, no, sorry. You are, are you? Sergio playfully asked the figurine. Do you have any tips? I could use some luck. I'm a lucky boy, the figurine said in a high-pitched child's voice. Sergio widened his eyes and stared. This wasn't just a figurine, it was an electronic toy. Surprised the toy was still working despite sitting in the rain, he was intrigued enough to pick it up. Wet, cold, hard and slippery, the toy was light and weight. And though it looked old-fashioned, it was in great condition. No paint was scarred or faded. Huh, interesting. Uh, Sergio turned the toy this way and that, looking for a control switch. He couldn't see one. He checked for a speaker and saw none. He even scanned for a battery compartment, but found nada. Interesting. So was I'm a lucky boy, all the toy said. Just for fun, Sergio decided to walk to the toy. You say you're a lucky boy, like your sign says. Good for you. Good for you, the toy said. Oh, okay, the toy probably had some stock phrases to play and it was programmed to repeat back what it heard. Is recorded. Its inner workings were surprisingly well hidden. It didn't seem like a cheap toy. Sergio decided to test his theory about the recording. He said, testing, testing. The little boy didn't repeat their words. Instead, it said, 
it's lucky to be lucky. Then it emitted a funny little ha 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 giggle. <laughs> oh no, I'm, oh no, I'm so sorry. Uh, Sergio smiled. The giggle was infectious. Sergio looked around. He was still alone. He looked back at the toy and shrugged. Do you have a name? Sergio asked the toy. My name is Lucky Boy, the toy said. Sergio snorted. I never would have guessed. Sergio wondered if Lucky Boy was worth anything. Probably not. But either way, he found he couldn't leave it lying there. It was unique and it looked antique. <laughs> Spit in those bars. Uh, he loved unique antiques. He'd make them part of his home decor. Tucking the toy under his arm, Sergio walked on. And within five minutes, he was in the gas station convenience store, making arrangements to have his car towed. While he signed paperwork, he set Lucky Boy on the counter. The teenage clerk behind the counter called the tow truck driver and then returned to the counter to watch Sergio sign papers. The teen was acne spotted and limp haired, but he was dressed in a clean blue uniform shirt with khaki pants and he was uh, friendly enough. Sorry, your car broke down, dude. What is that noise? Sorry, there's like a, a banging noise. I have no idea where it's coming from. <laughs> Apologies, uh, where are we? Uh, sorry, a car broke down, dude, he said. Hey, do you want to buy a lottery ticket for tomorrow's drawing? It could help pay for car repairs. No thanks, Sergio said. He was trying not to breathe deeply because the, das the gas station convenience store smelled like pork fries and dirty socks, but he involuntarily sucked in air when Lucky Boy said in his soprano-toned child's voice, it's your lucky day. Hey, dude, the teen said. Cool doll. It's not a doll. Okay, whatever. It's still cool. Sergio looked at the lucky boy and shrugged. Okay, I'll take that ticket after all. Who knows? Exactly, the clerk beamed. He rang up He rang up a ticket. Huh. There seems to be like a lot of um superstitious writing in all of these books. That's a common theme um, with a lot of these books, I think. Sorry, it's, it's, it's all like um, superstitions and curses and obviously things to do with agony and remnant and stuff. It was nearly 3 a.m. when the tow truck driver dropped Sergio off at his apartment building. Sergio didn't, aunt, didn't bother to explain Lucky Boy to the heavyset driver who eyed the toy and Sergio with suspicion. Tiptoeing through the hallway outside his apartment, he managed to open and close his door without being pestered. It seemed there was an hour passed, which Mrs. Bailey couldn't, would not stay up. He looked at the toy he still carried. Maybe it is my lucky day after all. Lucky Boy emitted his mischievous giggle. Smiling, Sergio took Lucky Boy into his bedroom and set him on top of his cherry buru next to the ceramic tray. This is like a repeat of To Be Beautiful. <laughs> then he emptied his soggy pockets, stripped off his ruined clothes, took a hot shower and fell into bed. Two and a half hours later, his alarm nearly catapulted him across the room, groaning. Sergio sleepwalked through getting dressed. Then he called a cab. Any wise words? Sergio asked Lucky Boy before he left the apartment. Lucky Boy giggled and said again, Today's your lucky day. Sergio couldn't say he agreed with that assessment, but technically the day was still ongoing. Who knew what could happen? Running on just two and a half hours of sleep, he sure could use a little luck. The day went by in a sleep-derived blur. He was a walking zombie, and when Dale corrected him on his math for the tenth time, the last time being when Sergio added six and seven and came up with fifteen, he finally admitted, Dale, I'm sorry, I'm asleep on my feet. My SUV broke down in the rain last night. I got two and a half hours of sleep. Go home, Dale said. Sergio flinched. Was he being fired? Dale laughed. You're not being punished. We're not total ogres here. When you need sleep, you need sleep. Go home and sleep. When you come back, maybe you can tell me what six plus seven is. <laughs> Thirteen. Uh, when Sergio let Violet know he was leaving, she offered to lend him her car. I can get someone to take me to your place later to get it. Then we can go out to that gallery opening I wanted us to go to. You'll be rested up enough by the end of the day, right? Sergio started to nod. Then he stopped himself. He didn't want to go to a gallery opening. If this was his lucky day, didn't he deserve to tell the truth for a change? He shook his head and refused to accept the car keys Violet was thrusting in his direction. I'm just going to call a cab, he said. 
Then I'm going to go to bed and sleep straight through until morning. I don't want to go out later. Violet gave him the little pout he used to think was kind of cute. He turned away from her and headed back to his office to call a cab. Oh, everything's in shambles. Can I predict? Like, I don't, I don't really usually predict things in the videos because I don't want to spoil it if I am actually right. But I... I, well, actually, this is definitely not right, but it would be a cool concept if this was his lucky day, yeah, but then every other day after that was his unlucky day, essentially. So, like, this is his only lucky day, and as a result of the lucky things from this day, every other day after this is going to be bad. For example, um, I mean, it's like the butterfly effect. Like, for example, um, he just refused to go out with his, with his girlfriend, or I, I'm pretty sure, like, their boyfriend and girlfriend... He just refused to go out with his, with his girlfriend tonight, and that is going to result in a breakup, right? So I'm assuming what's going to happen is, yeah, this is going to be an amazing day, but that doesn't mean that every other day is going to be like that day. It's going to be a lot worse, and then he's going to die or something. <laughs> On his way home in the cab, Sergio heard a news report about the big lottery, something about one of the winners buying a winning ticket at a gas station downtown. He wondered if it was the gas station he went to the previous night. He should check his ticket. By the time Sergio returned home, though, he was in a semi-conscious state. He didn't have enough energy to check his lottery ticket. Instead, he fell into bed and slept for four hours. He woke a little after 8pm, and feeling not even a little guilty about his latest lie to Violet, he ordered a pepperoni pizza. Taking it into his bed, because he was still too tired to think, Sergio turned on the TV. The, no the local news was ending. The perky female, Coanca, said, and to end on a light note, five people drew the winning numbers for the latest big jackpot. One of those tickets was bought right here in our town. Congratulations to the winner, whoever you are. That's right, the ticket. Sergio jumped off the bed. He dashed to his ceramic tray and dug for the ticket. Grabbing it, he picked up his phone. Bringing up the winning numbers on his screen, he compared them to the numbers on his ticket. He blinked and compared them again. They matched. Every number matched. Sergio jumped up and shouted, Yes! Above him, Thunderfeet pounded on the floor. Same to you, he shouted. Sergio ran to the bureau and picked up Lucky Boy. He held the toy out like a dance partner and spun around the room. You're brilliant. You're absolutely brilliant. Lucky Boy sounded off his funny little giggle. Oh, is, oh, that was... Oh, whatever. Uh, Sergio mimicked the giggle. Heh <laughs> And threw himself on his bed. He kicked his feet in the air and whooped. Thunderfeet pounded again. To hell with you, he shouted. He wasn't going to put up with crap anymore. He had the means to fix all the problems he had in his life now. Oh, yeah. Things were going to change. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be... A really good day for him and then things are going to change negatively rather than positively. Uh, and then Balloon Boy's going to kill him. Uh, the next day, Sergio called in sick to work. But uh, when Violet telephoned later to check on him, he let the answering machine pick it up. Then he visited the lottery headquarters to claim his winnings. Because he was one of the five people who had the winning numbers after taxes, he ended up with just a little over $600,000. That was okay. It was plenty. It was okay? Oh my god. What do you want? <laughs> I would love a $600,000. I'd retire and I haven't even got a job yet. Uh, back at home, Sergio relaxed in his living room and pondered what to do next. He had so many choices now. The car repair place had called him to tell him he'd had an oil leak that bled, that bled the vehicle dry of oil. The resulting engine damage would cost thousands to repair. Should he spend it or just sell the thing as it was for parts and get something new? Grinning, Sergio stood and went to get Lucky Boy. Carrying the toy back into the living room and feeling only a little silly, he asked Lucky Boy, Should I repair my car or get a new one? You deserve good things, Lucky Boy sang out. You're right, I do. Sergio sat back and put Lucky Boy in his lap. What kind of car do I deserve? You deserve to have your dreams come true. Really? Sergio thought about his dream car, the car he'd always wanted, a car that his father had once called an impractical waste of money, this from a man who had 17 cars. Wasn't having more than two or three cars an impractical waste of money? You don't buy cars for flash, son, Tony always said. You buy them for value. 
You buy flash and you're, t you're just asking to be ripped off. You'll pay more than the car is worth and you'll be a magnet for car thieves. What if I like flash? Sergio asked out loud now. You deserve flash. Like, there's so many different voices. You deserve flash. The lucky boy piped up. What should I buy? Sergio asked. Buy a flashy sports car. The more expensive, the better. Sergio fired off a finger gun at the little toy. Yeah, he's going to end up with nothing at the end of the story, I can tell. Uh, I like how you think. He ignored the part of him that was a smid smidgen creeped out by the fact that he was having a conversation with a toy. Lucky Boy had given him better advice than he'd ever gotten from anyone else. Who was he to care about where that advice came from? So he bought a bright red, expensive, flashy sports car. High-end, highly visible, and as impressive as all get out. Sergio's new car made him feel way more impressive than his silly aviator-style watch. And speaking of his watch, what kind of watch should I buy? Oh, God. <laughs> he asked Lucky Boy after he got home with his new car. You deserve boing. Sergio got dressed and headed back out in his flashy car. He went to the best jewellery store in town and he spent $37,000 on a new gold watch. It was impressive. After he got the watch, he stopped and called Violet. She'd just gone home from work. How would you like to have dinner at the Horizon? He asked, grinning when she sucked in her breath. The Horizon was the best restaurant in town. Violet squealed. What's the occasion? I'll tell you when I pick you up. Meet me out front of your building. I thought your SL SUV was still in the shop, she said. It is. I bought myself a new ride. It's red. You can't miss it. Okay, Violet said, drawing out the word as if she thought he'd lost his marbles. He laughed and hung up, driving to Violet's apartment building and revving the engine as he neared her building. He stomped on the accelerator to zoom forward, then slammed on the brakes, coming to a screeching stop next to the curb just a foot from her. She stared in open-mouthed shock at his new wheels. What do you think? He asked as the powerful engine rumbled and she gaped at the car. How? Violet asked. Project managers don't make that much more than senior architects. Get in. I'll tell you about it. Violet beamed at him as she opened the door. Over a steak... <laughs> she's a gold digger. Uh, over a steak and lobster dinner, complete with huge slices of the most decadent chocolate cake she'd ever seen. Sergio told Violet about his lottery win. He didn't, however, tell her about Lucky Boy. That somehow seemed like a secret he needed to keep to himself. And he should have kept the lottery win to himself too. Violet immediately started telling him how he should have spent the money. You should buy a boat. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> his car broke down. His, like, he didn't have a car anymore. And she's like, you should buy a boat. <laughs> you should buy a boat. She told him as she ploughed through her slice of cake. We could go out on the lake every weekend. Oh, and you should buy a timeshare. Then we could go to different places every weekend. Or maybe we could just take a trip around the world. Oh wait, a cruise. We should take a cruise or we could go. Sergio wasn't really listening to her. He was savouring the amazing chocolate cake. But he said, mm-hmm, at appropriate intervals until he noticed she wasn't talking anymore. He also noticed when she whacked his knuckles with her fork. Ow, what? I said, what is that? She gestured at his new watch. Oh, yeah, Sergio suddenly remembered. I forgot to show you this too. I just got this afternoon. It cost $37,000, but I deserve it. Sergio took another bite of cake. Violet touched the watch re rever reverently, sorry, <laughs> reverently and beamed. She looked at him, her eyes bright. So what did you get me? I was wondering all evening. I figured you have to got me something since you won all that money. I figure you can't be saving it for the end of dinner, but now I can't wait any longer. What did you get me? Sergio set down his fork. He looked down. What? Violet asked. You did get me something, right? Sergio winced. Oh, he's effed up. <laughs> he's effed up. Uh, um, you got yourself a new sports car and a $37,000 watch and you didn't get me anything? Violet's rose. Uh, Violet's Royce rose at least an octave at the end of the question. I uh, think, he told himself. Surely he could come up with some good reason he didn't buy her anything. Violet stood and threw down her napkin. Take me home right now. Sergio didn't argue. He didn't have the energy. And he realised he didn't care that she was angry. He just took her home. There, Violet got out of the car and started to walk away. Then she turned back and said, 
You'd better have something for me tomorrow, she marched off, her hips swaying emphatically in her wake. Sergio didn't give Violet a thought after he left her apartment building. He was feeling too good to be bothered by her tantrum. Oh, come on. It is annoying me how bad you are. <laughs> it is annoying me so much. When he got home, Sergio showed his watch to Lucky Boy. What do you think? He asked. Lucky Boy giggled. You look impressive. 